Is there anyone here that hasn't been to one of my presentations? All right, two up front. So uh, I travel all the time. I give these all the time. Uh, this particular one's on a cruise in Africa. However, the, about the first eight or 10 slides, the rest of these people have seen in variation at least 10 times. Uh, because it's, it's run through why we do this, which is bucket list item, unless we've traveled that. So I'm going to go through those pretty quickly. Uh, and then afterwards, if you want to come and talk to me about any of this stuff that shows up on these first slides, uh, we'll go through that. The other thing is, uh, if it's okay with Ron, uh, I will take questions kind of as we go. Okay. And I'll make sure I'll nod it, Ryan. I'll make sure that we're going to do that and everybody's ready to go. If you're going to ask a question, uh, speak loudly enough so I can hear you and I'll repeat it so that we don't have to have another microphone traveling around uh, in the room and it'll make it a little easier. But please, if you have something to ask, ask it at the time because you'll forget and I'll forget and it won't mean as much to you if we try to wait till the end. Yes. Pardon me? Oh, cell phone. Yeah, I don't remember where it is. Yeah, if you got your cell phone, uh, put it on stun or something, you know, so, uh, yeah. so it does that. Okay, is so everybody other than me ready to go? All right, now, buckle up, because it's 131 slides today. Yes, that's correct. 131, so unless you want to be here all dark, uh, we got to get going, all right? Now, this is uh, for the people that uh, are new here. This is us and what we've traveled and done, and we're up to about 108 countries, give or take. Uh, a couple, depending on who considers them a country or not. And, uh, those, those type of things. So we've been a lot of places and done a lot of things, and we've done a lot of cruises. It says that I think of somewhere 10 there, but we're probably up closer to 20 now. And uh, we've done three cruises over 70 days and probably 10 cruises over 30 days. So a lot of long uh, cruises. I always put these slides up, favorite places we visited, Wheeling, China, Blue Mosque, Machu Picchu, Atacama Desert, Wazoo Falls, my favorite one, the Iceberg, Burma or mm -hmm. Myanmar, uh, what's Falls? Not Victoria Falls is the other. Oh. It's uh, the one in uh, Zimbabwe. Second biggest falls. Anyway, cool. And these, except for the White House there, are, on, are from this trip. And actually, uh, three of these, those top three, are from this talk, from this presentation. So we'll talk more about those as we go. Here's what happened on the cruise, 74 days, start to finish Fort Lauderdale to Fort Lauderdale. The first uh, presentation I gave in this series, there'll probably be two or three more uh, after this one. Um, the first one covered the cruise in general, what it's like to go for 74 days, blah, blah, blah. And about the first three or four ports. Today, we're gonna cover uh, the next four or five ports or locations as we go. And so today uh, it's going to be uh, Crete and Tunis, um, Tunisia, uh, the Suez Canal, Sharm el Sheikh, and then Safaga, Egypt, which is uh, where you go to go into Egypt, into the Nile River, and then also Aqaba, Jordan, or Petra, Jordan. So here we go. That's the ship. 1,100 people, it'll hold up to 1,400. We had a lot of single travelers, uh, solo travelers, not necessarily single. I want to show this one again. I showed this in the first slide of the first presentation. I'll probably show it at all, just so people get an idea of what we're talking about and why this cruise takes so long. I mean, you think, oh, you're just going around Africa. Why 74 days? Well, look how big that is. Yes. Well, Rocky, is that one of yours, or can you get that one of uh, The question is, is that one of my slides? I did not make this slide. I plagiarized it off the map, which is I do with these friends. So, yes, just uh, all you have to do is Google how big is Africa. 
and it'll come up. Now, what you need to do if you want to slide is then if you're Googling up at the top, there'll be a, it starts on the left and it says all, and then the next word is images. Click on images, these will come up. It's a great slide. Yeah, it's, I think it's a great slide and one that I'll probably use in every talk, just to remind everybody what you're up against uh, if you're traveling to this continent. This is what we're uh, we're going to do today. Now, we in the last one, we finished up over there in Morocco, Casablanca. Now we go through the Straits of Gibraltar, or the Pillars of Hercules. Uh, unfortunately, that happened at 1.30 a.m. So there were people that got up to go look in the dark and see nothing. So we didn't. Uh, on the way over um, here, and it's uh, that's about a two day trip. It's two days to get there. And that you just don't cruise cruise on over there. And the first port we're going to talk about today is Tunis. A lot of these places that we visit have these kinds of signs somewhere around the town. Uh, our guide stopped here on the way. We're on our way to downtown Tunis to the what's called the Medina, which is the center market area. Uh, Downtown, and it's a uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site, and I'll talk a little bit more about those uh, as we go along. But that's the start. We are downtown. It is about ten minutes to eight in the morning. That's very early to get going on any kind of a tour on a cruise ship. So we're really lucky because there's hardly anyone there, because this downtown area is packed. This is a real famous guy. We've never heard of him in our in our part of the world, but he's a, a very uh, famous Islamic scholar, and he's guarding the entrance uh, to the Medina. And the reason he's there is he's a philosopher and a professor, and there's like a hundred uh, madrasas, which are learning colleges or equivalent, inside the Medina for studying the Quran. So that's why he's out front. And this is St. Vincent de Paul. And uh, this is right at the very entrance to the Medina. Um, and, you know, it's kind of interesting to have a Catholic church right in the middle of town, right at the entrance to the, to the Medina. And, the, and this will come up later. Note those two spires uh, at the top, because you'll see those again later, much later in the talk about Tunisia, Tunis. That little thing, if you look straight ahead past the fountain and slightly to the right, you see that kind of opening between those two buildings? That's one of the gates. That's one of the nine entrances to the Medina and the souk. Souk means market. Um, things. And the kids are already out 8 o'clock in the morning because their parents are opening their shop, the shops and the kids are playing in front. This is what it looks like at 8.15 in the morning. Uh, that's nobody home. In the market, there's nobody there but us, and we're walking up and down, and this thing goes for miles and miles, and it's about seven streets like this. Why? An interesting thing, if you see those archways, they've been supported. Uh, you can see those metal bars that have been installed. Those are not original. The reason these things are domed like that in every street, they're kind of covered uh, in a lot of ways to, to keep them warm or cold, depending on the time of year. But they had to be tall enough to get a fully loaded camel for So that's why they're shaped like that, and that's why they're that high. This is the, the first little uh, madrasa that we came to, built in 1750, and been active ever since, essentially an Islamic college, where they come and study. And, and again, at 8 o'clock in the morning, nobody's, nobody's nothing happened. There are probably hundreds of these doors like this throughout the nation. These keyhole doors, they're very famous in Tunis. Uh, this one's probably from about 800 AD, and it's the original stuff, the original wood, original carving, original everything. They've got stuff out in front of it, stuff out behind it, you can't, you know, can't get really close to it, but that's it. This is another one. Uh, and again, there's hundreds of these. This one you could actually go through if your guide knew enough to take you through it, which I just did. And that's what's inside. So this is once upon a time was another uh, college, but now it's a restaurant and in the courtyard. 
So that's, you'd never know this was there or existed if you didn't have a local person uh, take you through. This is the biggest mosque uh, in Tunis, uh, 864 AD. This is, uh, I'm shown here in this uh, thing, those two keyhole doors. Those are two of the nine entrances. Uh, it'll hold 25,000 to 35,000 people inside the mosque. That's how big it is. Yeah. Huge. Goes on for blocks uh, in each direction. And you can't even tell it's a mosque, hardly. If you look at that kind of top right slide or uh, top left to you, it's fine. Up right to you, also. Uh, that's the minaret for this mosque. It doesn't look it's not very impressive. It doesn't look like much, but that's the only indication there is at all that this is actually a mosque. Doing so. These are uh, some more of those entrances uh, to the mosque, which of course are not marked. You've got to know what they are, and we're not allowed to those. So one thing, and that's a Tunis Tunisia rule. In some countries, you can go in. They allow non-Islamic people to go in, not in Tunisia. In Tunisia, can't go in. Question, Rocky. Yes. Uh, what is the uh, roughly the amount the percentage that would be Muslim versus the Christian? But you had a Catholic church. Yes. The, uh, the question was, what is the percentage of Muslim uh, people in the population versus Christian? Because we did see the same thing as well. It's ninety-seven percent Muslim, three percent something else, not necessarily all Christian. So at one period in the history, there was when the Romans came and the Romans took over in here, and this was after 300 AD when the national religion of Rome was Christianity. So they started to have a church present. This one was just building to poke people in the eye. That's why it's there. there we've seen those all over the world where same thing with mosques. You'll go into a country and there's church, 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 church. church Mosque. The only reason the mosque is there is to raise an issue. Same with this one. Oops, the back one. That's another mosque. There's 574 mosques in Tunis inside the city. So this is another. This is really a nice. Uh, this is really a nice minaret here. Very impressive. As you can see, you don't ever get a good view of anything because these streets are all like this. They're all narrow. They're too narrow for cars. You can get horse cars. They don't no longer take cameras. Not like. <laughs> the question is were these one way streets for the camel? And the answer is only the camel? No. I don't know. If you ever heard the guy explain, I'm sure that they probably had pull locks where you could pass going uh, into the this is another mosque, and I threw this one in here that's been converted uh, into a government government ministry building, and it's a different style. So you can see the different architectural style, and it actually has some onion domes. And those onion domes are from Russia. So this is a, it's really interesting to see that totally different style that you just don't see anywhere, especially in a mosque. So that was kind of interesting. Now, remember I told you, remember those two spires? This is Jenny on the top left there. That's Jenny walking through. The, this is on the fifth floor of a jewelry shop. You go into the jewelry shop, walk to the back of the jewelry shop. There's a one person wide stairway where you have to get off the left, off to the side at one of the landings to let people go up and down. You walk up and you come to that arch. This was originally a very ornate uh, Islamic building. It's all in decay now, but you walk up and down, and if you look at the bigger picture, that you can see this. Can you see the spires? Anybody see the spires? Yeah. That's St. Vincent de Paul. That's how far we walk to get to that jewelry in the thing. And now we had to do what? <laughs> walk back. So 96 degrees, by the way. Oh, this is in the jewelry store. Did anyone want to get this? But I was for sale. That bed was for sale uh, in the jewelry store. Uh, after this, when we came down from the jewelry store, we went about a uh, block or two down, 
And the guy suggested we stop for tea, which is what they drink in the in the uh, Africa and um, Asian areas here. So we have that tea that you see in the lower right there is the normal tea that people drink for kind of like a special occasion. It's full of almonds. And those are all those white things are almonds and they're not roasted. Not roasted, they're raw almonds. And so yeah, it's really kind of good. And they and that's a very typical tea shop. Nobody there because again it's still still early. Uh, now this is after we walked back, we walked all the way back to St. Vincent de Paul, got in the car, and went and had lunch at a little Al Fresco uh, restaurant sitting outside, and this was our lunch. And it was all provided as part of the tour. We didn't get to choose anything. We sat down, this came out really good. Some people can't do that. You know, when they go and eat, this, this comes out and they say, where's that been, you know. And so then we went also in Tunis, and actually was there a long time. Tunis is Carthage. How many people heard of Carthage? Yeah, Hannibal, right? And uh, not Lecter. Uh, <laughs> And so this is a UNESCO World Heritage site, as is the Medina. Now, I was told you I was going to tell you a little bit about UNESCO World Heritage sites. We try to see whenever we're able and we're in a place and there is one of those things, we try to see them. 157 of them in the world. And it takes years to get vetted and approved to be one. I mean, the paperwork's about this step for the individual countries and cities to apply to get designated. And it has to be a no kidding world heritage site to be approved. So Carthage is because there is no more Carthage. This is all there is that remains for the things. This is a, the, the building in the picture here is the museum and it was not open on the day over there. I think it was open. and it was closed. So we did not get to go. But this is the grounds. Carthage. Now remember, this is now close to 1230, 1230 after all the weather walking and doing things, and it's 96 out there. So this is hot uh, out here doing this, but really impressive by me. Huge public ground. This these ruins gotten this way. Yep. This is, these are the these are the Ruins of old Carthage. This is the old Carthage. See where it is in the picture there in, in the left hand side. That's the guide. Now, this is a local guide. Carthage. This is not our guide. It's at these you know, UNESCO World Heritage sites, and we picked up another box. This is a Carthage dock who's leading us around. That road that Jenny's walking on, that's one of the Roman roads. Uh, built after 146 of BC because that's when the Romans obliterated Carthage. They came back about between 50 and 100 years later and resurrected the whole city. So that road was put in by the Romans and it's been there since one, not 146, but a few years after 146 and it's still a perfectly road. All the rest of this is real Carthage uh, from the and you can see it was a really an impressive place. And one of the, the most amazing things, and we'll see this in various locations in Africa, uh, is that how do you manage the water? And that was, you know, that's an issue in all these places and all these, there's no water and it doesn't rain enough. And so they have to build viaducts, they have to build collection systems, they have to build storage systems, they have to build distribution systems on how to get it out of the cistern and back into the, you know, it's no minor engineering feat to do that. And so it's always impressive if you think about that, to watch what they build and how they did in order to, to make that happen. The uh, one in the top right there is a Christian chapel. This is from the later Roman area, era, probably in about 400 AD. You know, it's kind of a new, new kind of thing. It's only from 400. Uh, AD. Uh, bottom right, that was their games area. Uh, and we'll see these just about everywhere you go because the Romans always had those kinds of things. And the one, the, ru the ruins on the left there were just a normal neighborhood. And you can get a really good idea what the houses were like by walking. Uh, 
uh, in that housing area. But this is an interesting uh, thing. These are all original structures, original caves. The, the great stellas, the top, one in the top left there, are very important because they have inscriptions and runes on them. And they have been uh, translated. And so a whole pile of how much they know about Carthage came from those. Came from those because there's lots of original information on there, on those stellas. And they're often graves. And then this on the bottom left, this is a sacrificial chamber where they sacrificed children. And that was a very big part of their culture in ancient Carthage was to sacrifice children. And they know that from these grave stellas because probably 50% of them are from children. And it was a real honor for their family to have that happen. And so hence, they spend the money on the Stella. So that's something that I've never heard of before. And I found to be kind of interesting, just a little off for you. Yeah. These are all over. These are original. Uh, and you see these when you're walking around in the walls and the floors, uh, in the, and it just shows you some of their my vague capabilities in our world. Uh, just amazing things from, you know, around after these, most of these are after 146, after part. And this is the view uh, from the upper ruins where Ginny was standing, you see that road, that's the original road, that's the original uh, road, on, and where Ginny is standing is where the houses were. So they were built up there and done that, so you'd have this view looking out over the water and the bay and the harbor. And it's, it was really would have been a pleasant place to live in that time period. The third place we visited in Tunis was this place, City Bu Said. And they they termed this, they being the Tunisians, they termed this the Santorini of Tunisia. Anybody heard of Santorini? Been there? Anyone? Guess what? Me neither. It's one of the places that we've we've never been to yet. We've been to every almost every island that surrounds Santorini. It's a Greek island in the Aegean. Um, but this is a beautiful view, all whitewashed, all blue windows, all blue doors. And it's just, uh, the whole idea is it's just very, very soon. And that's why it's so impressive. The interesting thing is, of course, now we have this, remember the walk we had in the morning from the Springs and out back from, from St. Ben's to the Paul, and then we had all these miles inside. Well, now this one, get, where's this one set? Up on the hill. So you've got to walk up and walk down. You just can't take cars up there. And uh, so that was a lot. And uh, so we get, this is uh, one of the views from one of the higher points in the island. You can see how Jenny's concentrated here. We are just about out of airspeed night at this point. For, uh, thing. Uh, one of the things, I don't have a picture of it here, but we did stop at a little uh, restaurant in the plaza and had lemonade. It's the best lemonade. And it was really nice because it was the equivalent of a dollar of rice for fresh squeezed lemonade. Really nice. This is on the way out. Uh, this is the city booth uh, and that we saw that on the way out, walking down from the city. And that ends our day in Tunis. And this is Jenny relaxing now, finally on the ship. Uh, that's the harbor. We are just now uh, sailing out and we're heading out from Tunisia or Crete. So off we go. And here's our route over to Crete. This is two more days uh, from Tunis over to Crete, which is an island uh, off the coast. It's it's part of Greece. We're actually going to the, the port. We would say Chania and they say Hanya. They don't pronounce the city. Uh, over there. This gives you an idea of uh, where Tanya is. It's the star, the five-pointed star 
on the left hand side. That's where the ship docked. The star that's on the north coastline there is Heraklion. And right next to it is a place, and Jenny and I have been here before, the tree. And uh, it has a place next to it called Kenothos. Does anybody remember ever, yeah, reading about Kenothos, Seven Wonders of the Ancient World, Kenothos of And it's a ruin very much like Carthage. And it's the old Mycenaean cultural hub. So they were the Phoenicians formed that board, formed all of the culture, and then they spread all over the Aegean from there. And then they were wiped out. So I just put that in there. We've been there. I didn't put any slides in because we did not go on this trip. Because we had been, um, we did something else. And most of you know that I'm really kind of a wine geek. So we did the wine tour. And uh, this is the start of it. Not wine, but olives. And so uh, a little bit of background of our guide. His name is Vasily. Vasily was born in... San Francisco. <laughs> His parents were from Crete. They immigrated and spent years working in San Francisco. He grew up, went to college in California. They went back to Crete to the home place. He stayed about 15, 18 years in the U.S. and said, oh, I'm going home to try to save the home place because they could no longer keep it up. His parents. That's the story. He's our guy. So he opened a tour guide company for wine tours. And that's how we got linked up with him. And that's the olive tree. That's a 2,000 years old olive tree that's in the lobby of this, or in the uh, courtyard of this mm -hmm. olive prep company. That's one they used up until about 1950. That's the press they used in this place that we're standing. That was the normal press to make olive oil. These are olives as we're standing there looking at that press. These guys show up in those bags. They're all olives to be pressed. The way this works is these uh, folks have their own olive groves, the people that own this press, but they will, for a fee, press olives for other groves and uh, people. And so that's what they're doing here. They have to keep them all separated in a specific place. And then when their batch is up, they come and they press them and then they get the oil. And these are the two individuals that they sell it themselves under their label, not the one of the, of the olive press. And so uh, that's what's happening here. This shows you kind of what happens. It's all automated. You dump the olives, you can see them there, dumping them into a bin. They go up the elevator network, uh, dump down into crushers. And, and things, and then they have this big mixing, like a big mixer, except the blades are horizontal instead of vertical. And it just stirs these things and it turns into a, just kind of an ugly gray green pulp. And then they force it out the end, and the olive oil comes out into the pulp. And that's, that's how it works. And it doesn't take them very long. Yeah. They can do about uh, in the old days when they had that old crank one, they could do about 200 tons a day. They can do 1,600 tons of it. That's a lot of olives. Uh, oh, and, they yes. These out somewhere? Yeah. Well, no. They crush them, and that's part of the flavor of the olive oil. Hmm. Yeah. No, they don't de pit them before they crush them. Too much work, too hard to do. And this, of course, every place you ever visit that does things like that, they have to sell you something. And so this is what happens after you tour the whole facility and come out here. here and they've got 10 kinds of olive oil and five kinds of vinegar and other things, that, all of which they make there. And, that, and we brought home, of course, some of it. And it's really good. Some of it, the green stuff, can. you see that right in front of Jenny, there's a, looks like a can about this tall. It's, it's like an 18-ounce beer can. It's about that size, a, a tall can. That is the unrefined, unrestricted, fresh olive oil. That will knock you back. And it will only keep about two months. And then it's no good. Uh, the things you got to We bought some of that. And you uh, got to use a bit of so strong and almost bitter coming out. But it's really fun to try to figure out how to use 
what to do. So we do you do with the we we used it to make both feed and pasta uh, on the things, and you have to put other stuff in with it, other vegetables, potatoes, pasta, and things that draw that uh, bitterness and out of it. it. But when you're tasting it here, it's off. And we're tasting it, and he said, okay, our guy, said, don't pay any attention. Buy some of it. <laughs> Okay, so we did. And he's, he's right, but uh, he was a good guy. That's the seller right there. And uh, that's, he takes us from there, and we go to this winery. And it's really a cool operation. This is what it looks like here, doorway. This is how they are storing their bottles and their, uh, their barrels. You walk through this area to get back to the the uh, barrels by the bottle stage. If you you've got to really enjoy wine to get a, get a kick out of seeing this stuff. This is to me this is fascinating stuff. Look at this. Look at that. And that's how they, these things on the on the left hand part of the slide there have been sitting like that for three years. That's dust and things all over, and, and they're going to sit there another two years before that wine's ready. They're going to leave that wine in the bottle for five years before they market it. So I, I just think that. And then the most important part, outside, under the grape arbor, at this table, the only foreign people within 90 miles, everybody else are all Greek local people out having wine, and we tried 11 <laughs> different kinds of wine. So that will get your day going. You try 11 different kinds of wine. Uh, and we did not buy any wine, and, then, and that's a cruise ship. Can't really take it back. And then we went to Vasily's place, his house <laughs> in the mountains. His house is in a village that is at the highest village that permanently inhabited on Crete. And that's because of? No. They get as much snow up there as we get in UP. Now, who knew that about Crete? I surely did. I thought it was kind of a deserty something island, but if you know anything above this town, you can't can't be in the winter. It's too much snow. You can't do that. This is the old home place. His parents have a really nice house in town. He lives out here uh, on the home place, middle of nowhere, top of the mountain. And he is what? Making wine from the family vineyard. So that's what we're out here to do is how do you really make wine and if it's not a big, huge commercial operation? And here we are helping out when you do that. So that's the Zilly. He's, he, that's called the cap. The thing you see the Zilly on the left. He's testing that to see the temperature of the wine. He doesn't, they make thermometers and put in there. So it's 68. Nine says no. Oh, okay, that's fine. <laughs> he reaches in, and if the temperature is right, then you stir the cap, you punch down the cap uh, of the things, and then you let it sit another two, three days, and then you do it again. And so that's Jenny, and it took her 15 minutes to punch down that cap. It's hard work um, to do that. That's me doing the important work on the left. <laughs> Is that's tasting the stuff out of last year's production barrel to see which ones we want to take with us because we're going to go out into the uh, courtyard. Uh, this is not courtyard, up into the vineyard. We almost couldn't do it. I mean, this is we're probably at 7,000 feet altitude, 8,000 feet. And we had to walk up three or 400 yards up the side of this hill to get to the vineyard. He's got a table set up out in the vineyard there, and that's where we had our lunch. And everything's prepared from his garden, his wine, his honey. You see the pictures of us there, that we were collecting honey uh, while we were out there uh, in the vineyards, and then we had lunch, sitting in the middle of the vineyard. Awesome. If you're a wine person. Did he make meat? He bought the meat. He bought the meat? The meat. Oh, no, meat. And meat. Oh, no, he doesn't make meat. Like me, he doesn't like me. <laughs> I've tried it. I don't, I'm not, everybody know what meat is? Fermented honey. 
It's it's a drink that's very popular in Scandinavia. It's famous because of Vikings. The Vikings make me drink, uh, and, and uh, to me, it's just I've, I've never. Um, it's like honey with alcohol. Yeah, I mean vinegar sometimes a lot. Of it, so it's, it's. I mean, I love sweet wine though. Yeah, I I can't do meat. So, uh, he doesn't do. It. He does though. What he does, and this is, he doesn't sell anything. He doesn't sell his honey, and he doesn't uh, sell his wine. Although next year he's planning on selling his wine, some of his wine. But what he does is he packages it up, right? Then, and he gives it to all these people that he uses on his tour. So he'll go down and give honey and give things to the to the wine press box and things. And so now he's they're very happy to see him. And so it's and it's really, really good. Rocky is Dick Bremer. What? I just Dick Bremer from this the Ethernet, you know. Yeah, what up? What do you want, Dick? Uh, the barrels that I've seen are kind of curious. What do you know what the wine barrels are constructed of? Yes, oak. What? Wine, the wine barrels are always oak, and there's two kinds of oak barrels, French and American. French oak barrels are stronger, and I don't mean tensile strength, I mean in flavor, and that they impart to the wine. And so they will... Uh, pull more tannins and take more bitterness out of the wine than an American oak barrel will. So some of the really strong, high alcohol wines, they almost always want French barrels. White wines and more subtle wines, they like American barrels. So the barrels that you saw in those pictures, both in the, in the Greek thing and the ones Bastille had, are French. Those are all French oak barrels. A used one, they be people like these. Even that vineyard doesn't buy new ones because new ones are seventeen hundred dollars each for every yes, seventeen hundred dollars each for not the big barrel, this barrel. You can buy a used one that's been used three years for about three hundred dollars. So that's what they buy. They're using used barrels. And then they have to adjust what they're going to do because they will not be as uh, as efficient extracting cans and things as new barrels. So that's what you have the adjustment you have to make based on cost. Yeah, go ahead. Does so, he harvest his own cork for the bottle? No, no, he buys it. He buys it. He buys it. Yeah, and they, I asked you about cork. I, I said, why don't you go to plastic? But, all the things you read or learn about plastic is every bit as good uh, as pork. And he says, we don't have any trouble in the EU. We don't have any trouble getting pork. Pork is, and it's not any more expensive than, so he would rather for the aesthetics have pork. So, but he does not do it himself. Yes. Peabark is there. Peabark, where they're high. Each one of those boxes is a hive. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a single box in each hive. Yeah. Standard saw. You can see the ones we're holding there. Can you see those in that one picture? And, uh, yeah, that's the socks. There's just one. There's not multiple ones in each box. Just one in each box. They live there. And he goes and gets bees from all over. The island. He's become known as a person who will come and help you if you have bees show up that you don't want wherever you are. And he gets them, and then he tries to figure out how to keep the queen there. And they can have bees uh, put their money around to get their young. Yes. Yeah. The queen has to be there. If they don't, if the queen's not there, they won't do it. They will not make honey do that. The queen has to be there. She has to be making new bees. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's really amazing. It was amazing to me, I guess, how much you actually do get because they make honey, he extracts it, puts it back in, and they make another one. Yeah. I mean, they just keep going because they have said, well, crap, where are honey going? And they, uh, excuse me. Go away, don't be there. Yeah, well, that happens. 
think it's uh, you don't necessarily have to, but it's uh, I don't know all the technical details except he really loves doing the hunting. And he, he, he does, Bill, not, uh, he doesn't do the pork, but he does harvest all his own grapes uh, out there. He, they have about seven acres. Now, that doesn't sound like much. That's a lot. That's a lot of grapes to be doing by yourself uh, out there. Now, what he does is he shares with people, he shares with people from the wine press and other people, you know, they come and help him and then what? One. So that's it's kind of cooperative. Like, better get going, or we're going to be like Saturday. <laughs> and uh, this is the last thing uh, with Preet, and the last thing with Vasily, and that's Jimmy on the left, and she is corking the bottle. So we, you saw me tasting the wines in an earlier slide. We retasted all of his again. He has seven barrels there, so we retasted those and decided which one we wanted. He poured the, that wine into one of his bottles, labeled it with a gold magic marker, uh, and Jenny put the cork in. And that was his gift to us. Now, once again, this is non-pasteurized, non-something, non-anything wine, so we had to drink it in about two months period. This we did take back. And they let us take it on board. Amazingly enough, I don't know if they didn't see it or whatever. But we wave it around. And uh, I don't know what happened, but we got it in and then we drank it on the ship because it wouldn't last. It would not have lasted the duration of the cruise. You saved the bottle. We have the bottle. Yeah. Off we go. We're going again to uh, around our route here. And we're going to go. We start at Port Said at the north end of the uh, Suez Canal. You can see it here in this diagram. Kind of to the left of the words of Suez Canal. Uh, the uh, here's some of the uh, you can look down through here and see a little bit of the details and, and uh, significant issues of uh, the Suez Canal. Uh, this uh, now it was built in like the 1848 or nine or 59. Some took 10 years to build. Uh, the Lessups. I can't remember his first name. The last of his black came from France, designed the canal and had it built, and, and it took 10 years to build it. Relatively easy because this is sort of a very arid area. So no rainfall, no earthquakes, no things. You didn't get stuff falling back into the ditch as you were digging it. The other thing is the elevation change from Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea is almost zero. So you can dig a canal, let the water flow through there, and you don't need blocks. You don't need any way. The water levels will you know, equalize between the two, and you have a canal. So who was the first guy to design the Panama Canal? The lessons. Did it work? No, not at prayer, because we had like 800 feet of dirt you had to move to do that, and he didn't know about locks and couldn't figure it out. So he was the one they originally was supposed to design the Panama Canal, and it failed miserably for France uh, because you, you had to have the ability to do locks and things because you cannot equalize that water. Thanks. Interesting things here. Uh, and we'll, I'll give you the next one here. That's us entering the canal. That's the front of the ship. Going on in, this is one of the first bridges we came to. Uh, you can see that it's not refined on the edges or things. There's there's no erosion. They don't get enough water. They don't get anything. So it's kind of um, self-maintaining. They don't have to do a lot of work to keep the canal uh, in navigable condition. Uh, they did do a big adjustment. Let me get a couple more slides in here. That's the back of the ship. So the, this, this, these two photos were taken like 10 minutes apart, however long it took to walk from the front of the ship. Okay, so that's the same view. That's our trailing ship. And you always, it's just like that all day long. There's that kind of separation between ships and away you go. There's never any space, never anything. You're going through uh, as you go. Uh, some interesting things there, our ship, 
uh, we had 1,100 passengers, and there's some kind of uh, uh, some kind of scale that's based on weight and passengers for cruise ship. So our fee to go through was about how much? Three hundred fifty thousand dollars <laughs> for our ships. And I do think about how much were each individual on that ship paying for this cruise, and the fee for that ship to go through was three hundred fifty thousand. Okay. Yeah, one way. Now we didn't go two ways, but the fee for a one of the big super size container ship or super tankers, there are a thousand feet long, some of them 1,100 feet long. They weigh at least two times as much as our ship. And they're about six to 700,000 <laughs> one way. 20,000 of these. So amazing operation. These are, this is what you see off to the side, on one side, only on one side of the canal do you see this. This is kind of the, they're both Egyptian sides, but this is the Egypt, Egyptian side. What's on the other side, anybody know? Sinai, the Sinai is on the other side. What's on the Sinai? Nothing, except military. So uh, from different people, and so, uh, yeah, so you see this kind of development and see, yes, go ahead, Bill. Is Alexander at the port? No, Alexandria is not at the port at the top. It's I don't know how far, but it's a trip from the oh. from the Port Said to Alexandria is I don't remember how far, but it's a it's a trip. It's not right at the oh. entrance to the to the canal. I've been there too, not on this trip. Yeah. Anybody else? This is what happened here. Oh, that's kind of stupid. That's the view uh, straight overhead. Uh, the ship is we're passing through, not that first bridge you saw, but a subsequent bridge. This is the view out the back of the ship as we have just come out of that twin channel. And up until like the early 2000s, there was only one channel. And so that was really slow because couldn't pass the camels. In the couldn't pass the camels, so they came up with this two two lane thing. It's about thirty five miles long. That's part of the thing. And now they can they can sequence things really well. Uh, to do that, cost them nine billion dollars to do that. Nine billion dollars. That is emergency bridging equipment on the side, on the Egyptian side of the canal that is prepared to be able to build a bridge you know, across the canal if they need to to get to side for various reasons. But as the Sinai has been an area of some really big battles in the past with Israel and likely to be. And that's part of that saying idea that's a, a swing bridge that is used to create an emergency crossing if they need it it's not used for normal stuff and this is the end the very southern end uh, of the canal and that's the port suez lighthouse and that's how you know you're at the end and off we go oh shoot i'm i may even make this by close to the right time not really uh, for us, this is Sharm El Sheikh. Anybody heard of Sharm El Sheikh? Been there? Anyone? It's a. Uh, it's in the Sinai. It was developed into a tourist spot by the Israelis, and I'm not sure whether the Israelis took it over in the '67 war or the '73 war. I think the '67. I can't remember which one, but they took over the Sinai, and then they developed this as a tourist port. And then they gave the Sinai back to the Egyptians in 1979. So the Egyptians have had this port ever since, this uh, city ever since then, and they've developed into a tourist mecca for the Middle East. And it's all about snorkeling and beaches, fabulous snorkeling uh, and beaches there. And 70% of the tourists that go there are Israeli. So that's pretty cool and pretty interesting to have this. Uh, Egyptian place. This is us in the waiting room. There's a camel uh, on the way by because we're going to go ride one of these, and they're called a semi-submersible. 
uh, type thing. And this is to take you out to the reef and let you look at the wildlife and things without actually snorkeling, because you're getting it into the lakes. So we did this. That's the inside of that. Now it's lit with blue light. Uh, and, and in this shade, so that the light will come in from outside. And when you're looking out, everything is normal color. So if I looked out, I would see all these colors and normal things for fish and reef. You try to take a picture, doesn't happen. Because every bit of the light you get back into your camera is blue on the thing. So that's what a picture of a really vibrant coral reef looks like, looking, at, looking out the window. Okay, off we go. That was a quick trip. And then we go to Sapaga, which is a really awful like, port in its own right on the Egyptian coast. But if you look to the to the left there of Sapaga, you see Luxor, one of the most famous places in Egypt. Jane and I have been, we took a cruise of the Nile. We've been all the way up and down the Nile. We spent three days in Luxor, so we weren't going back. So we went to, see those two temples listed right above Luxor? Abydos and Dendera, that's where we went. Nobody went. We were the only people on our ship that went to those uh, things. And they're both places, Luxor and those four-hour drive, over not-so-nice roads. And so you've got to be sucking it up to go this is, you need a little bit of this uh, just to know some of the things that you're going to see when you go in any Egyptian temple of things. Uh, on the left there, this is at Dendera. We're going to go there first. That's easy for me to start. Hathor, H A T O R. And she is one of the primary gods in the Egyptian deity uh, realm. And she is the god of the sun. She is, she is subservient a little bit to Ra because. You know, they were a patriarchal society and not a matriarchal society. So Ra is the big god. She is the number two god. Hathor is the number two sun god. That's why she has the sun disc up over her head there. And the cow horns are fertility. That's the symbol of fertility. And then the ox, you see that she's holding that. That's her. Then her son or her lover or her father or whoever you're talking to will say that that's next to her there where that looks kind of like a hawk and that's Horus H-O-R-U-S and he's one that we all can recognize every time we see him in any kind of hieroglyphic or any kind of painting he's really easy to recognize as is the next guy over there and that's Anubis A-N-U-B-I-S and he's the god of the underworld and he's in charge of getting people uh you know, through successfully uh, uh, into the heavenly realm afterwards. So you kind of need to, there's about 20,000 more uh, gods in their pantheon, but these are ones that really help you kind of understand some of the things. That's Dendera. You guys are right. Anything, any significance to the staff they're holding and the other thing that's yeah, in the left a hand? symbol of power. Okay. And there's, it's a, a leaf. I don't remember the kind of leaf. There's a leaf on the end. It's there, it's just like a scepter. Okay. Yeah, it's a, they're a symbol of power. Um, and that says Dendera, which we can all read. And this is it from the outside. This is the Hathor Temple. Actually, Dendera has four or five different buildings. This is by far the biggest and the most imposing. It gives you an idea how big this is. Uh, looking at it, standing from the outside. Not, not all that impressive from the outside, but Pretty much so. But when you get inside, it's amazing. Now you see Jenny there uh, for scale uh, in those pictures. And every one of those columns is intricately carved in the bow of Astrid. It's just unbelievable the amount of carving. You could spend an hour, this is the entry. You could spend an hour in there walking around. And you can see there's nobody here. That was a really cool thing about this. Nobody here. Oh, there was one other German tourist group of 10 people. And that was it. Oh. oh, what happened? You said, they said it took this four hour trek up there. Who took you? A uh, guy. So, so we, we, hired, uh, we hired a private company 
And uh, they picked us up at the ship in a car. And we went with a, we had a driver and a guide. The driver spoke that much English, and the guide spoke okay. And so, uh, but yeah, that was it. The buses went to Luxor. 90% of the people on the ship went to Luxor by bus, five hours each way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but with 65 of their closest friends on the bus. So not a great, not a great time. Okay, I'm gonna run through these. If anybody wants to go slower, things we go. This is the kind of thing you see. I got it up here. So I'm gonna have to look over my shoulder some things. My the computer just went away. I don't know what I did, Ron, but I screwed something up. My display is not displaying. Uh, these are things you see everywhere you look. Now, this is interesting. See, this is Jenny at the bottom of this little walkway, uh, no camel crossings, uh, down here. And if you see behind her, you see a little doorway. And that doorway is about that high above your back when you get on your hands and knees. So one person can go down. There's just enough room where Jenny is standing that if you hang onto those rails, you can let yourself down and get on your hands and knees. And then you turn, and it's about, the wall is about six or eight feet thick to, to crawl through that thing into a separate chamber and then stand up. And there are 12 crypts down there. This is all subterranean that they only discovered three years ago. They had no idea that they were there before that. So this was amazing. And I mean, we've been all up and down and now we've been to every other place that there is in Egypt, and this is the best place out of this part here. That's Jenny in the first room. Did you crawl through there, Mark? I did, it? and she did, yes. This is what you see. This is the first room. Mm -hmm. you're mm -hmm. They didn't know this was here until three years ago. These, there's 12 rooms down here. And it's, I mean, it's not bright like it was just painted, but it's like it was just painted. All the colors are vibrant. Everything is like it was. The time on this one is not, it's not Middle Kingdom. It's not 1500 BC. They think this is much newer, like 800 BC. So this, this stuff is like only from 800 BC. Uh, and it's just like brand. I mean, it is, your jaw literally is falling out of socket uh, going through this place. And I, Trust me, I have at least 50 photos of these places down here underneath. And you can get the, the whole story, the whole idea of their religion and realms by walking around in here and see who's doing what to whom. And you can recognize a lot of the, and ibises are very formative, those are the, the birds. Ron, a question? Do they lie to you as flash? No. Camera? Well, no. Okay. There are people do. Uh -huh. uh, you really don't need it with good cameras now. There's enough light in there. They have light provided, obviously. You see that? There's no way for light you know, uh, down there. They, there's enough light. These are all taken with a phone. You know, and they're... Now, if you were a collector or something, you probably want a better picture. But uh, for everything... That we want the pictures are fine. Yes, Mike. Well, these things were very So the point of retaining the point of the You don't really touch the stuff. No, they, they, uh, the question is do they clean this or try to restore this thing in the upper level where it's been subjected to? I mean, some of these, I didn't really put any of these uh, pictures in, but I probably should have. In some of the rooms upstairs, people lived in them, Christians, because they were escaping persecution. And so they would build fires and live in the solo. They were covered in soot and smoke. So they did try to restore that and take some of the things off. Down here, they don't want to do anything. And they limit, fortunately for us, nobody's there. I don't know the dog. You know, this is a hard place to get to. This, this particular place, but they limit the number of people because your breath 
has a lot of moisture and things in it, and they don't want that to affect the structure down there. So it's a great question, and the answer is they don't want to do anything. This stuff is amazing. It does not need restoration to knock your socks off. That's the ceiling. And this one I took, there was a whole courtyard full of small little statues and things. And this was my favorite one. I really like this guy. Little dwarf statue best. He's the god of music and merriment. You can kind of tell that by looking. He's in there. Now, then we took off and we're going to go to Abydos, this, the next uh, thing. And on the way, the little thing in the, in the lower left there, we stopped there. That's where we had lunch. And our guy said, want some lunch? We said, sure. That's, we pulled over the car. But that stop got, and we got this little bag with stuff in it. Kind of like a soft taco thing. And we're not sure what any of the other stuff was. <laughs> and, I mean, his English wasn't good enough, and it wasn't normal stuff for us. And it was pretty good, and we ate it. So uh, didn't die or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just the Nile up there. And these are street-side shots of just things we passed. Uh, these things here are on the way. Uh, that's just a little mock up there. These guys, the ones that, that was really cool. Kids playing pool. That's a pool thing. Table on the left in that shot. And there were young kids out there playing pool. And then this is uh, five young ladies in their full burkas, split uh, things right in the equivalent of a taxi. There. So, this is the second temple. This is Abydos, and it is really unimpressive from the outside. Just you know, industrial awful. But, and the inside's not much better. You know, you walk into the courtyard, this is the this is what you see when you first walk into the temple, and you say, oh, man, this might have been a waste of trip. And you're saying, uh, I'm not sure, maybe we should have stayed in Dendera. And then you start getting into the little side chapels, and you run into peace. And this one, the colors, of course, this is all above ground, so the colors have faded a lot more than what you saw in the other ones, but the relief is two or three times as high. The carvings are two or three times as deep. And it's intricate everywhere in this as they were in Dendera. So a whole different kind of impressiveness that you see going through that. And again, so you can see some of the soot and the things here from this one where they had fires. This wall was 40 feet long, one carving, one thing. That's in say Anubis here on the on the left. And this is uh, as you go out through a different courtyard, they did have some carved columns, but not nearly as impressive. But going out, when you go back out the other side of things, you notice that these columns in front are all carved. Square ones. And really, really, really well carved. So those are pretty impressive. Each way, and we spent a few minutes walking up and down and checking things. It's very deeply carved. And again, that's the original paint and the original things from this one is from about 1500 BC that this is here. So it's unbelievable. Okay, now we're going to whip back up to our last stop. Anybody been to Petra? Yay! Okay, top how many places in the world? Did you know? It's up. Yeah, I, anybody that you've ever talked to, if it's not in their top five, they're my hope. Yeah, I would say. I mean, it is unbelievable. Okay. It's better than Egypt in a lot of ways. Now, I love Egypt too, but it's better than Egypt in a lot of ways. And I understand we've been there before 25 years. There's a lot of things that have changed, not necessarily for the better, and I'll talk just a little bit about that as we go through, but it's still unbelievable. And then Wadi Room is uh, just a big desert area about halfway between Petra and Aqaba, where the ship is. And I'll talk. 
Okay, this is a little, I'm just going to let you give you about one, two minutes and let you read through this stuff. Uh, two key things, one key thing, actually, I'm about one point one million visitors in 2019, before COVID. Enough time? This is the layout of the thing. Now, if you see, look at this thing here, you start down there in the lower right-hand corner, and then that maps out your group that you walk. You hire a guide. They have a queue of guides there. You walk up to the guide window and say, I want a guide. You pay, I think it's like $25, something like that. You pay that money, and the next guide in line comes out, and they're with you, where you go. And they have just continued. So you get a guide for us every two people. Even one, if you're one person, same cost, and, and away you go. And they know their stuff. They don't get their little guide doohickey if they don't know their stuff. And off you go. Now, the distance from that visitor center to the museum down here is four kilometers, 2.5 miles, 96 degrees. So uh, be advised, you better. Better be kind of out there. Okay, now we're starting. We're walking down. This is about a quarter mile, a third of a mile down the path on the way in from the visitor center. And the first big thing you see is this thing uh, on the left. And that's relatively new. It was built in the second century. Doesn't really count. And it is Roman. It's not Nabataean, which the Nabataeans built Petra. The Romans built this. And this is the start of the SIC, F-I-Q. Unbelievable. And this is one of the things that's changed, not necessarily for the better. Now, you can see the little dark cart things there. You can rent a golf cart, become a, a passenger in a golf cart. They hold six people in the golf cart, and you pay $20 each ride to ride down and back in a golf cart. And, I mean, there's people that do that, but that's not the way you get the Petri, you walk them, you know, and the thing. And it didn't matter when we were there, That was, this was all desert sand when we were there 25 years ago. You had never got a golf cart or any other thing other than a camel down that, down that path. So that's different. And so you're always moving out of the way for some stinking golf cart down, down the thing. And it's not really paid, but kind of paid. You know, it's, it's good enough that you'd probably consider it paid. This is part of the irrigation system. And they uh, they had great irrigation. They could they knew how to collect water. They knew how to save water. They had to move the water out of their cisterns back into the city. They were terrific engineers, all carved out of the rock. Still further down the city, this thing is half a mile, almost half a mile as you're walking in this came naturally formed. They didn't they didn't cut this out. This is a naturally formed canyon. Now you can kind of see here, uh, we're getting close to the end. We're probably within two or three hundred yards of the end, and you can see the really bright kind of gold color thing at the end there. And that's the start of the treasury, the most important or famous uh, building in Petra. I can't remember, even remember why I took that picture. It's some little temple. There you go again. Now it's a little bit, bit easier to see. And almost there. And this is, we were there about noon, which is a perfect time because the sun's up high enough. This, this channel is really narrow, really deep, as is the park back there. So the sun has to be very high and shining down to illuminate it, or it's dark and shadow. When you get that, when you walk out of that opening, it just blasts you. And that's it. That's the most famous building carved out of the cliff face uh, in Petra. Uh, and you can see the size, the relative size of that. Uh, how did you do that in, you know, stone tools almost, and some bronze tools, and you carved that out of the side of the cliff face. Uh, and it's called the treasury, but it was not a treasury. It was never a treasury. They think it was a tomb for one of the kings. At the time, 
and there's another shop. Uh, it's it's just you can just stand there and look at it. It's just amazing. This is indicative, and we talked about that in the Egyptian thing. All these things that are underground. There's a huge complex underground that we never get to go. To. Only archaeologists and and people that study that get to go underground. So I have no idea what's down. This is if you walk around that crater, if it's here, you walk around it, around the cliff to the right, that's what stretches out before you. And buildings on the left and on the right, and big planes on the right, and there's just stuff everywhere you look. And then you see the taxis here. I mean, you've got the, the donkey taxis and the camel taxis and the, you know, the golf cart taxis. Now, this is, uh, Jenny and I did stop, because once again, we're getting tired in this little stand and had fresh squeezed orange juice, or uh, lemonade, excuse me, fresh squeezed lemonade available there in that little uh, kiosk. Most people wouldn't do it because it's like $10 for a glass. <laughs> Believe me, that's the cheapest lemonade I ever. I was dying. <laughs> this is on the right-hand side. See so, you those know, people up on the side of the hills and up in the... You can get it gives you an idea of scale. These are the part of the royal tombs up on the in that part we were standing. If you go around treasury or any lift, this is on your right at the second part up high. Let me tell you how much fun that is to get to. Climb up to where that guy is up there in the top, and you've done your work for the day. That's uh that is quite the effort. If you go around the treasury to the left, then the monastery path is up there. And that's not my idea of a good time either. If you see those steps going up that valley and up the hill, you can do that. It's completely allowed to do that. And there's the taxis waiting. It's $10 to ride a camel one way from the treasury to the museum. That part of the thing we, we talked about. So it's $10 each way. Yeah. And there are people doing their, you know, the little donkey carts, the donkeys. People were doing anything to avoid walking. This is part of the housing area on the left-hand side. So now, again, walk past the treasure where you walk down, and on your left, this is all part of the housing. That's a, this is shifting again back to the right-hand side. All that second-level stuff are the royal tombs, and this is the only tree in Petra. That, that tree, and that is a two to three thousand year old olive tree. The only tree in the whole place. And this is the grand temple or great temple uh, at the end when you get down in these. They had a lot of Hellenistic architecture, a lot of columns and things. You could see that in the treasury, Greek style. And, uh, and this was also, they have not reconstructed the colonnades. But that was a key. You can get again an idea of the size of that building uh, based on the people. On the left, you can see, or on this slide, you can see on the left, that's the uh, the games area where they would they they had the gladiators uh, and things that would come here, and it could hold somewhere between five thousand. Some people say up to eight thousand people. That's a lot of people in that time era. Thank you. From there, on the way back, we're on the way back to Aqaba, we went to Wadi Rum. That's not my photo. It could be, though, because that could be Jim. We, uh, <laughs> we did that. So This is our chariot. Uh, we got there late because we walked the whole thing. Our guy said, we don't think it this long. Well, he doesn't know that we're seven years. So it took us about an hour longer than, than he predicted for us to walk down and back uh, on the thing. So by the time we got to Wadi Rum, we were an hour late, and they were almost closing, 4.30 or something. It's, but our guy was waiting. This is a new guy, not, not the one we've had. There are new guys right here in this truck. He's a better one. He lived there. And the things, we hopped in the back of the truck. We got to go. We don't have any time. See, I said it could be Jenny if I'd have been standing off to the, to the left hand. Anybody been to the dunes here up in Michigan? Walked up them? How hard is that? 
This is that on steroids. If you walk from our truck down there, our truck down there, to up there, which we did, that's awful. But we did it. You had to do it, you know, standing there. Just fantastic, unbelievable landscape. That's what it's all about. Nobody there. Nobody lives there. Now, there's, there's better ones that have through that occasionally. And all the people that know anything about this are done. Now, this is interesting. I'm going to leave this up just for one or two minutes. And look at that list of movies that were all filmed in Waterbrook. And why were they all filmed there? Because of one, right? Because of Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence of Arabia, the original version, was formed, filmed there. And all of these directors and people saw that landscape and said, I want to go there. So that set off the yeah, right now. Do I remember right? Lawrence actually was in that area. Yes, Lawrence over at T.E. Lawrence. Yeah, T.E. Yeah. Lawrence, the, who was in the revolution uh, at the time. That's how Wadi Rome became known to the local people and to the things because that's where he operated. He could move around out there with his Bedouin group and nobody could find him. And they could they could do um, you know, guerrilla attacks uh, and things because his Bedouins knew their way around, nobody else did. But that's how you're right. That's how this place became famous. And then when someone decided to make the movie Lawrence of Arabia, they said, we have to do it in the real place. So they came here to do it, and then when the movie came out, it became the place, became famous. And now, you know, the Martian is a very pretty recent flick, Matt Damon in there. And then the two pretty recent Star Wars flicks were both part of them anyway. So. Now, look at that. Excuse me, is there any water? No, there's, yes, no, yes, no. Um, there's water about twice a year. And that's it. Wadi, the word wadi, it essentially means valley that is scoured by water very infrequently. And so a wadi is a thing that's been formed by a flow of water when there was a deluge somewhere. And it swept through, but it rarely, rarely happens. And so that's it, hence the name Wadi. And you see these Wadi names all over uh, the area. And it does rain, but very, very infrequently. Yeah, Mike. Uh, I don't know, to tell you the truth. Wrong, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not really sure. I did read that, but I've forgotten. There's a ton of wadis. Everywhere you look, there's a wadi in that area. That's true. This is kind of interesting. My Our guide said, give me your camera. Give me your camera. He took this picture. Now, how he did that, I don't know. <laughs> you know he took two pictures and knitted them together somehow. And, and he moved and took it in two different directions. So he took the picture in two different directions. So the background was different. And then he knitted them together. And, and he's got the actual track behind you, so it looks like it's one. It's how he did that. No idea. That's kind of cool. Now, this, so they do have sandstone out here. It's really porous and light. And so, you believe that? No. This is a little stone that he picked up off the ground and held here and took a picture. And he said, Jenny, go out there and stand and put your hand up. He held the phone. This is why, as you can tell, this is a huge place, hundreds of thousands of acres, 50 trucks in this place. Why? Petroglyphs. There are 25,000 petroglyphs in Wadi Rum. Um, this is the only one that I took because there's so many people and we were running out of time. So we went up, looked at them. Other thing, I took this one. They're really interesting. We can, of course, we can all recognize the camel and the people and the water. And you know, if you really look at this, you can see what's going on. And what these were were travel guides. Almost all of the pictographs in Wadi Rum were travel guides because there's no roads, there's no set route to get from here to there. 
you're wandering around the middle of the desert, you have no idea where you are, which way to, to get where you're going. So they would post these behind them and, and say, we came here and did this and did this. So when somebody's coming the other way, they can stop at the travel guide and, and say, hey, if we head over this way here, there's water. There's a thing over here. And then the next guy's following them and do the same thing going the other way. So it's, it's really amazing. They are not just going to, to uh, record what they were doing. They were about future travel out there because there was no way they could navigate in that environment. If you can stay out there, which our guy said, hey, you got to do that. You got to come back. As Harry said, it's unbelievable. There's nothing. Total quiet. Total. And then this is our last event. He said, okay, sunset's coming. He's going literally like 80 miles an hour in the back of the truck. Over, he runs up to this sand dune. It's a once again, one more sand dune. We get climb up this sand dune to get on this ledge. And there's, it looks like there's other people, but that's it. Those people and us. Sitting here, and those people have a better one with them that I'll show you in a minute. He's making tea, and he has picked up this little plant about this big and set it on fire with his flint and steel. And he's heating tea on a little metal teapot. So they he gave us tea, a little had little glass cups and gave us a glass of Bedouin tea for the sunset up there. So this is why we're here. We're waiting on the sunset, and the timing's about right. And that's it. And that was, and it, this, of course, like most pictures of Senka, does not do it any justice for what it is. Just take your breath away. Beautiful. Oh. And we sat there for half an hour until it was dark. And that's it. That's our last little bit of this section, leaving Wadi Rum. And then the next time we'll go somewhere else when I do these again. But that was the end of our tour for these four places and it was really a great way. And any questions? I'm sorry, I always run over. You guys, you, you know to expect that when you're coming and hear me. I always run over. Uh, but I still want to leave any of this stuff out. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And the island that you were on was high elevation. Yes. And they get thrown there. Do they like skiing on that island? They do. Yeah. Oh, they have a snow now. Yeah. Not as we would. If they're skiing, but it's it's for the people on the island. People don't travel to that, you know, from Europe to there. They'd rather go to Austria. But if there are ski resorts there for the local people, and they go there and ski. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I can't remember an individual thing. Almost something every time. Uh, wine, you know, Jenny and I always try to bring that, you know, it's almost impossible to do now. You can pack it, you can still pack it in your luggage and and bring it back. And <laughs> we've done, up until they prohibited that, we've done a lot of, uh, we do a lot of nuts and things and, you know, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> We have spice, we bring back spices. You gotta watch spice because if there's dogs in the terminal when you're going, they'll alert on stuff you would never expect that they'll alert. So you've got to be kind of careful on spices. But if you want to buy some cinnamon or some things like that, it's covered. And they don't uh, they can't smell it. The dogs can't smell it. Do that. But yeah, the spices are a big thing because uh when we were in India, we bought all kinds. Uh, and also, in uh, we didn't go there this time when, when we get down to this part of Africa. Uh, but one of the ports we went to on our last African tour, we went to an Indian shop in that because 30% of the local population is Indian, from India, Indian, and we bought fresh spices uh, from there. So, spices are a big. That's it. and then wine, uh, but you got to you know meats and vegetable and things you can't really can't really bring. It has to be some kind of non-perishable things. And our problem is, is we try to pack pretty light, 